Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll selfishly be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. Zurich is the proud partner supporting this episode. As one of Australia's largest life insurers, Zurich encourages the promotion of positive conversations leading to a more sustainable future for life insurance. Committed to championing financial advice through education and research-led market insights. Hey guys, Ben from the XY Advisor crew and today I'm pumped to be here with Gavin Glozy. Gavin is Principal Advisor and CEO of Your Wealth Hub Advice and he's also leading a community of like-minded advisors through the Vinart community. Gavin, thanks for joining us, buddy. Great to be here, Ben. Good to see you again. Mates, it's uh, always a pleasure to catch up with uh, with you. And look, I, I feel like I can finally, you know, hold my head up high having moved to the beaches after <laughs> uh, after all those conversations after so many years. So, um, yeah, man, good, good to not be letting the team down over here. But absolutely, um, mate, I'm keen to I'm keen to chat a bit about. I know you get exposure to a lot of businesses, particularly through that Vinark, um uh, community, but before I dive into that, um, can you, you got a pretty chunky team and a big um, offshore team through that community. I, I'm I, I feel that uh, for you know leaders in business and for advisors, even advisors within businesses, that you realise that it's your output ends up being the um, your team. You know, your team ends up being your your mini business within a business or the the business itself. So I'm keen to unpack selfishly, get a few tips here. Um, around what are some of the lessons that you've learned around building a a, a great team that that performs well yeah yeah really yeah good good question ben the, the the challenges that we looked at when we started the community was how to be efficient how to be scalable how to look at solving problems that um you know we probably hadn't really kind of embarked on right yet but we wanted to preempt a lot of the kind of structural issues and systems and processes that kind of, I think a lot of practices get really stuck and bogged down on. I found that over time, you know, working with businesses, both in the institutional world and, and, and now out on, on our own through the community, there's a lot of information that's out. There's a lot of solutions that you could use, but the, the catalyst was always implementing, um, the, the catalyst for change was always how we implemented this and who was going to hold these business owners accountable. So mm-hmm. when we tried to solve these solutions, we really looked at understanding pain points, repeatable tasks, um, and, and that's off the back of that, understanding what problems that we could solve more efficiently um, and using outsourcing solutions to solve these problems meant that it would free up advisors to be able to be more productive and spend more time, more meaningful time with their clients. And at the end of the day, if that meant that they could see more clients and, pro- and provide a better service, then everybody was happy. That then kind of brings in the conversation of how do we go and engage, who do we engage, um, you know, what skills are we looking for? And it meant that we went basically to the Philippines where we had some experience with in the past to, to look for skill sets that fitted the solutions that we wanted to solve. So initially we went by um, looking for skill sets that solve multiple problems, which I think probably was, you know, probably our first error. Having people who could solve multiple tasks meant you never got someone dedicated to a particular problem. And I mm. think also it meant that, Having uh, generalists, you've never got that deep kind of uh, rich education or skill set that solved a problem really, really well. You kind of skirt it along the, the surface. So the generalist model, I think, by outsourcing was something that we kind of wanted to move away from. So we learned that lesson really, really early. As we kind of progressed and started hiring these specialists, um, we understood that you know we had the opportunity to scale that and bring more businesses into the equation. And it went beyond my business initially to other businesses that were in our license that were joining our license. And then we expanded to businesses who wanted to join our community that could tap into some of these resources and infrastructure that we had built. So they would then benefit from this as well. So specifically speaking, it started off with that generalist model. That didn't work particularly well. 
And then we went out and looked for specialists to solve those problems. And then we found more specialists to build out the, the team for, for multiple practices that, that use those services. So that, that for me was, was a really big eye opener. Um, and I think it was more that we had just worked with generalists in the past and it seemed like it was the right thing to do, but we mm. get better long-term results. Now we have people with you know, deeper understanding of the problems we're looking to solve. And because now we have that scale that sits around us, um, you know, we can't afford the luxury of having multiple specialists or different people in different fields to come in and, and kind of round out that, that, whole, that whole solution we're trying to solve. Yeah, totally. I know for us that we started um, building out a, an offshore team. Well, tried and failed a couple of times, but um, started uh, probably maybe two and a half years back getting more into it. And it starts sort of like you that we brought people in and they were, were trying to get them to do, you know, the new clients plus the reviews plus ongoing mm -hmm. stuff. And it was just breaking their brain. And I think partly because they um different financial services system, not used to the legislation, the process, the advice. And that was one of the things that we ended up tightening up. What are the things that each team member focuses on mm. that allowed them to build a better understanding and better skill set in that task. And since that time we've had for our longer term team there that that we've expanded those um, their roles into other areas, which is which is working well. It's just I found at the start that they were finding it overwhelming and um, mm. yeah, it wasn't effective in terms of actually getting getting those results. Tell me, yeah. you, you've got like a um, couple of dozen uh, team offshore. What, in terms of remote teams and remote team management, and that's something that I think has just been forced on a lot of businesses with uh, mm. through the COVID disruption, but what have been the, the things that make the biggest difference in, in having a team that is remote working well uh, from yeah. your experience? Yeah, we appointed a dedicated HR manager last year in the Philippines. So her whole role is ensuring that welfare is, is taken care of. So if there are concerns, um, you know, there's a dedicated point of contact. Previously, that was me, and that's not sustainable, um, particularly if you're looking after clients and a license. So having someone on the ground, we had someone part-time there who was doing administration and some HR responsibilities um, throughout the entire time, but it was never a full-time dedicated resource with kind of big business background. Now we've got this person there, Regina's the backbone of kind of the way that the community runs there. She's she's fantastic. So in that, it means that we've got someone who can monitor that, that welfare, monitor security, uh, monitor kind of hours, and we track everyone's, well, from a security perspective, we track everyone's um, you know, kind of activity and that's important to understand if there are hiccups or delays or outages and things which do happen from time to time. A typhoon Adet came through and hit Cebu particularly hard at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the team were impacted. Um, straight away, we were doing whip arounds um, within the community and, the, and our advisor community to help support um, the people on the ground over there. You know, we had I think about eight or, or nine people that were impacted, two who lost their house completely. So it was it was it was pretty serious, but we were able to quickly mobilise the team to support them. And I couldn't have done that without the help of. Um, Regina. So for her being there on the ground and understanding intimately what was going on, she was able to find the right resources to help you know, connect people to, to help them out. So for me, that, that, makes a, that makes a really, really big difference, whether it's a major event like that or it's the day-to-day -day running of the administrative side of the business. You know, she's on top of everything over there and allows us to really focus on you know, the important things that we need to do to, to either run the license or, or run our clients in the, in the advice business. Yeah, totally. I know for us, we use BA Platinum as a BPO, and one of the things that we was that was such a huge help when um, that typhoon hit is that those guys were just all over it with looking after the team, making sure that they were sweet. They set up like a uh, place they could go, and some people didn't have access to food and water and stuff even. So um, having that layer of support, I think, it, it is key, and, and especially as your team grows just from the administration side that it does become um, challenging for onshore and offshore teams. So the support, yeah. support there is... It's, 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 it's interesting, right? I, I often see there's, there's two approaches to offshoring. There's, there's people who expect the solution to be there on the, on the shelf ready to go and we can hire someone and it will solve your problem straight away. Um, and then you've got the other who are willing to work with the team member um, as part of you know this broader team with the the feel the look and feel of kind of what it is to to be working in the same office as this person that inclusion creates loyalty um, that inclusion creates longevity 
in their business. Um, and you get far more out if you're putting as much as you can into it. And I've seen many times, and we always stipulate when, when staff are hired, you need to put the time in, you need to build the processes, you need to make sure it's really uh, clear and apparent for the person who's coming in what it is their role is and then how they need to execute. And you need to put that time in. And I've seen it fail too many times with people wanting to have a solution off the shelf and they don't put the time in and they wonder why it's not working and they go back to hiring um, you know, these tasks that can be performed by by talent offshore, yet they employ some over here at two, three, four times as much because um, they're afraid of that change. And that's that yeah. business. In, in an environment, I think, where businesses are, are struggling to remain profitable, I think, um, you know, this is a logical solution to help, you know, be able to scale your business and remain profitable. But it's just, I, I find it kind of counterintuitive if we kind of stick with that, that type of resource in Australia where really it's not performing any benefit to you longer term. Totally. And it's it's actually challenging. Like we've been hiring for people for what seems like an age and it's hard to find good people and people that are happy to do like just general administrative um, type stuff. And I think, yeah, definitely for us that one of the fails when I mentioned that we tried and failed a couple of times with offshoring initially and both of those times it was very much like we're just expecting that the that that's that you know there's the if we use the BPO one time went direct another time, but that the person would just get it and could do it without treating them like a team member in our um, in our Sydney team. Whereas now it's that we've got an integrated team. It's just in di- in different locations, and um, yeah. I, I think it's unrealistic to expect that any team member you know, onshore or offshore is going to work and work close to their their potential without, um, you know, doing all of the things that you need to do as a team, yeah. the performance planning, the support, the interaction, exactly. the social and all yeah. of those things. I, I think, you know, the, the, the parallels drawn for me and what I explain to people is if you had someone new join your team and you kept them in the dark office in the corner and, and checked in on them once a week, um, and, and didn't understand what they were doing, who they were, and what drove them. You kept them in the staff room the whole time. Do you think you get the most out of that staff member? Because because that's the digital equivalent of what you're doing to the staff member you know, virtually. In the yeah. So yeah. You, you can't expect the best outcome if you keep someone in the shoe closet because um, you know they're out of sight and out of mind. Simple as that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's look, it's easy. I think that, and partly probably the, just the industry that sometimes people package it. Um, as that and, and think that they can just buy, uh, you know, yeah, so a solution without putting in the work. But unfortunately, that's, that uh, doesn't exist, certainly in my experience at least. But, um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, so, look, Gavin, obviously you get a exposure for a lot of businesses. You mentioned you've got like seven or so different businesses in that um, Vinart community and, and sort of sharing resources and learnings and ideas. Tell us through that, and I know that you've had broader exposure to advice businesses for a long time. We've met initially through your involvement with the AFA that we both um, uh, helped out with through various committees and whatnot. Um, What have you found over that time? Like, What makes the difference between businesses that are thriving and those that are just doing okay or the ones that are struggling? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it is mindset. I think understanding and being intimately aware of what clients actually want and being um, being close to your clients. And I think part of the first part of the conversation about understanding how to scale and, and looking at problems that are needed to be solved and and, and, and I suppose utilising technology, understanding that you, know, you, you can get a good outcome from using offshoring solutions. Um, understanding that that mindset of growth Having a growth mindset, I think, is the first piece, understanding how to scale and how to solve those problems. But also <clears throat> being close being close to those clients means that you can adapt your service proposition and you know evolve your service proposition um, as time progresses, as you get more segments or subsections of clients that you may want to grow closer to. Now, whether that's young accumulators or, or young um, middle management executives, or if it is that you're finding that your client base is moving to that pre-retiree phase, you know, your offer needs to evolve and match and, and engage. One thing that we do do is on a quarterly basis, we come together with the, the seven practices and the, the, the four or so that sit outside and we do run quarterly summits and we share our business metrics. We have a very open door policy for everything that we do. Um, we have our summit yesterday um, and we did a lot of work on 
um, ourselves personally, understanding you know, personality profiling, how that plays into the business environment, how we conduct ourselves in the business environment, understanding how different personality traits um, impact the way we engage our clients, in the understanding how we engage and, and work with the information that's in front of us, how clients want to perceive the information that's being presented. So we, we did a lot of work on understanding how that translates to the relationship and overall growth of our business. And, and they're the types of questions that we, we would solve um, together. Um, that in itself means that we have this you know, really rich um, level of information that we're sharing constantly and refining. And, and I think mm -hmm. that openness to change in that growth mindset by utilizing that shared knowledge and that shared understanding of, of common problems um, means that we can adapt very quickly. We can be nimble um, mm -hmm. and, and be able to adapt our service propositions and, and, and adapt for change and working with our clients. And I think that's that's what I've seen across bigger businesses. You know, some of the biggest firms that are out there, they still are relatively nimble and can act quickly, albeit they may be you know, managing you know, a couple of billion dollars worth of, of management with a couple of thousand clients. You know, those businesses still act mm -hmm quickly should they need to change because they've got the infrastructure in place and they're ready and understand that things change and they need right. to move with that and evolve accordingly. Totally. Yeah. And we, like I was saying to you before we fired up the camera that we've been recruiting for senior advisors mm -hmm. and senior associate advisors over the last little bit. And obviously the people that you're talking to for, for those roles are people that are looking you know, looking for the, their, their next opportunity. And the biggest frustration that I've noticed through those conversations, because obviously we want to understand why someone is looking at um, looking at moving on, is, is businesses that struggle to adapt with the change. And there's a lot of change being forced on us in the last couple of years through all the COVID, you know, how we're working, who we're working with, how we've adapted to growth, making sure that we're still getting growth or still looking after clients and, you um, yeah, not, not struggling on that front, but it's really those businesses that um, the ones that have taken the longest or the, the that, that can't budge on certain things that it becomes a real frustration. I think definitely when you're younger as well, that you feel like you've got a more just a naturally, you know, um, expectation of change. So mm -hmm. it means that when they're not happening, when it seems like a simple thing, and sometimes it can be a simple thing, but for bigger orgs, maybe not so much. Um, yeah, it does. It pisses a lot of people off, and and I think for business owners, if you if you're not um, yeah don't have that flexibility, then it can be hard to keep good people and to keep a good environment as well um, yeah. within businesses. But yeah, we've yeah. done a lot of that that same personality or like personality behavioural profiling, and I find that stuff intriguing as well. We do that with all of our new team when they come into the business, and it does drive a lot of we use the wealth dynamics profiling. It's like how people think and you know understanding where you're in flow where you're not in flow then also that i've been doing it i got exposed to it through our business coach that we've been working with for about five years and in that time i've learned a lot that you it also is how you communicate with people i'm like i like bullet points and succinct communication whereas some people that they want that they need the story that sits behind it or they can't mm -hmm. sort of grasp when they think that the bullet points are aggressive and you know, yeah. obviously it takes all types of people to create a good team, but um, yeah, it's super fascinating with, with that stuff, but it is some good insight. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you know, a couple of our advisors, their outliers on some of those personality traits, very dominant in particular traits, be extrovert or introvert or um, whatever it may be. And, you know, some of those, some of those people will want to sit behind the screen and email out to the advisor, to, to the client. Um, what it is the message they're trying to send, but all the the client wants is to sit down in front of you and yeah. actually discuss what's going on. They don't want to read an email because they don't feel uh, emotionally connected to the message. And mm. I think they're acutely aware of how people perceive information and how you need to adjust. Um, I, I think is a skill in itself that I, I think is I wouldn't say unique to financial advisors because there's other people who sit in similar positions of of, of immense kind of importance in people's lives, but. You know, we certainly play a critical role in you know, being acutely aware of how we respond to situations and, and how we act in certain situations, how we interpret data and, and, and how you should be translating that is, um, is hugely valuable. That's part of the reason why I think it's so important what we do. Um, but that being said, I think advisors themselves, you know, I've been in the industry for um, 20 years this year and, you know, I've seen so much change the entire duration of my 20 years. 
Um, yeah. I think for a lot of advisors, you know, change is just this one constant. Now, if it's not, you know, at the moment, you look over the past month, things that have been happening, you look over the past six months, things that have been happening, the amount of legislative change that's occurred, but then you go back to Royal Commission, you go back to FOFA introduction, you go back to, um, you know, choice of super funds, you go back to FSRA launching the interim period, Wallace inquiry, you start going through this change has been this, this, this pit. change is almost normal. And I think yeah. the, the beautiful thing that we have been able to do as practices is been able to be agile and nimble and change accordingly. It's whether well, it's been forced upon us and we've liked it or not, the reality is businesses have always had the ability to change and we will always have the ability to change going forward. And I think that um, agility means we are well placed to work with clients as their needs change as well. And I think that's a part that, you know, we really don't celebrate a lot is the fact that we have actually endured change, but we should be wearing it as a badge of honour as opposed to running away from it and saying we're never going to change. Well, the reality is we have. And yeah. That's it. Totally. <laughs> yeah, well, the rate of change is, is increasing as well, and I think that we've seen some pretty significant legislative changes, which has sort of dragged um, advice out of the age of those conflicts and things mm. that it really have a negative impact on the, the reputation of the industry. Thankfully, we seem to be close to where, you know, where I, I don't know that there's going to be such drastic changes in terms of the approach because they're ultimately working towards making sure that advice, you know, that your clients, that you look after your clients, that you contact your clients, that you um, deliver what you're supposed to deliver. And, you know, arguably that should have existed for um, for some time prior prior to it actually coming in. But I don't, and, and no doubt things will change around the edges, but I feel like a lot of the core stuff is there. But regardless, if there's not another lick of legislative change for the next decade, it's still going to be an immense amount of change with how we're interacting with our clients, how we're working with our teams, how we're, what, so, what solutions we're delivering for our clients, like what makes sense for them to be smart with their money and all of those things. So, you know, I think if, you, if you're not, um, if you haven't figured out how to change by now, you, you're going to really struggle to be part of the, uh, the future of the, of the profession. So, yeah, um, I, definitely I a skill set in itself. I, I agree. I think kind of normalising the use of technology, I think, has been just uh, the rate of change that took place in the last two years as people saw uh, the inability to sit in front of a client face-to-face -face and the, the speed at which clients adapted and were completely comfortable after years of hearing clients don't want to sit in front of a screen. You know, how yeah. efficient is it sitting in front of a screen? At the same time, how draining is it sitting in front of a screen for an entire day doing back-to-back -back yeah. meetings with clients? Like it is super draining. And, and, and one thing I found is um, I'm, I have the ability to talk to so many more people and have meaningful conversations, but it is mentally draining because, uh, you know, you, you're doing so much more to be engaged and look for those kind of signs um, that clients may be displaying that you would ordinarily see and, and, and touch and feel in a face-to-face you know, -face environment. But your brain's working overtime virtually mm -hmm. trying to understand, what Ben, what you're thinking, how you're feeling, you know, what's the body language telling me? And your, your, your yeah. brain will wear you out um, doing a full day of that. So I, I'm finding mentally it's more draining, but I think it's proven that um, the adoption of technology was always going to happen. It's just been forced upon many people. And I know I've not had one client who said, no, no, I don't want to catch up virtually through that period it's they've been completely happy to do that and um, yeah. it's kind of exploded that theory that i oh, yeah, we weren't able to do that when in fact you know we could have done it the whole time so again more efficiency yeah. that's in our practice now uh, yeah absolutely and we we used, we always had an element of virtual in our meetings like we had um three or four meetings in our advice process and we always used to do one of them virtually but we now we're doing well, I, don't, I can't even remember the last time we did a face-to-face -face meeting, although there have been a couple of clients that were keen to come in in between the last two couple of lockdowns. But we've onboarded, you know, um, a bunch of clients that have got millions of dollars or eight figures of wealth. And, you know, you'd previously think, oh, that's a that's like a, a you know, high-end client and therefore we yeah. need to, maybe we should sort of pull out the stops and, you know, um, get them into the office. But it certainly hasn't been a barrier for us. But, yeah, yeah right. I, at the same time, I also get the Zoom fatigue thing. And I think it's not just that it does take a little bit of extra energy to engage across Zoom. It's probably more so that when you're back-to-back -back in meetings um, 
on Zoom, you don't get those micro interactions that you get with your team when you are sitting in the office, that you shoot yeah. the breeze a bit talking about non-work stuff on the way into the meeting room or, you know, you overhear someone on the phone and then you have a bit of banter around it. I, as much as I'm a massive introvert and I love working, like I love working from home, but I found it training to just go Zoom this phone call there, do an email, like it's just bang, bang, bang. And it's like humans aren't built to work, just like be on um, like yeah. that all the time. So yeah, I, I agree. I've found that in the, in the second lockdown in particular, that people have come, I know that I certainly came to that realisation and a lot. I think a lot of businesses did as well and they weren't putting as much pressure on their teams to do that. And I think that people realised that they need to take care of, you know, um, what's up here and, and their mental well-being and stuff. And yeah, I think I think that's uh, that it's a necessary again talking about adapting to change. It's a necessary skill to build to to survive through this and be able to still perform and and look after yeah. yourself. Um, yeah. Gab, what are you seeing like uh, in terms of trends at the moment with the with the businesses in your community? Like, what's what are the key sort of pain points or focus? Um, Focuses uh, focus for for those businesses. Yeah, um, yeah. Fresh from yesterday, um, staffing is probably the number one. And looking at where we're going to find the next layer of associate advisor to help with the evolution of um, the practices as as businesses grow. I think you know in, in our community, the practices that work with us, they're typically younger, kind of under forty. Um, they are growth focused, they've been working elsewhere and now they've got their own practice. So they're, they're really keen to see that evolution of technology, um, you know, scalable growth. But the challenge comes with you know, at what point do you bring in another advisor? And I think that's really holding um, a few people kind of uh, back, I think, from the growth they probably would want. They've hit, they're hitting that number of advisors, uh, clients per advisor that is sustainable, but they don't want to go too far knowing that it's going to be overloaded before you bring in that next person to help transition relationships across. So yeah. I, I really see that as being a, um, an, an area that a lot of practices are, are struggling with. And I don't think as a profession, that professional year and that kind of that um, transition from university in understanding that client service role into associate advisor, junior advisor and, and, and et cetera, has, has kind of gone on really well. And I think that there is an opportunity to, to, to again, band together and, and, and look to see at, at what stage the pool of people that fit that profile, how do we kind of give them the exposure so they get that quickly quickly or quicker so we can bring people yeah. in. I know, we, I know we talked kind of, again, before the, the, the session about kind of hiring and, and the implication of having these huge remediation projects that are mm -hmm. you know, going on with the, you know, the big four accounting firms. There's a lot of people in that environment that have left the advice world um, or, you know, seeing as power planners or compliance people that have been drawn into these really, really big salaries. So as a result, supply and demand, you know, we're paying really big dollars to get people that are, are relatively junior and don't have the experience to fit the price tag that they're asking for, but the market's dictating what price is actually on offer, which is really hard. Yeah. But I do think kind of as these remediation projects roll off, I think we will start to see a supply, a steady supply of people who fit the bill, whether they're appropriate, I think is the, the kind of big question we need to solve. Will they be good to target and approach new clients or will they be good to work and farm with existing practices on reviews and, and managing mm -hmm. existing clients? I think that's the conundrum and, and kind of double-edged sword that I think we'll be facing. But, yeah, staffing I think is the... The big one what do we do uh, how do we bring talent through um, how do we navigate that professional year I, I just don't think there's been enough in the in the professional uh, in our profession yet to, to make that work um, mm. the, the, the profitability and scalability question then comes in after it you know if we've got too many clients working with advisors how do you become scalable if um, you, you can't get the resources and I think for certain tasks and processes in your business you can look offshore for that um, but still, I think for managing clients and you know, utilizing an element of technology and an associate advisor, I think that's that kind of void level in the middle. So I mm. think until we can get that that piece solved, I think um, profits will be stagnant for a period of time. I don't think you're going to be able to grow unless you, you know, increase your fees significantly, which then begs the question, why are you increasing your fees? Is it costing more to service and a client's going to swallow that pill I, I, I'm, I'm not sure at this stage. I'm not seeing. I'm seeing a lot of loyalty in, in our community for clients. Yeah. We're not seeing a lot of attrition. We're not seeing people leave. But 
we're seeing um, businesses grow, but you're going to find that growth is going to be stifled because we don't have that middle layer nailed. And I think that's yeah. a real end point for a lot of practices at the moment. Yeah, totally. I think that there's a lot of pressure on the bottom line with the big increases in costs, licensing, technology, all of yeah. those things that um, that plus salary is definitely, you know, increasing or, or on the up, like you say, trying to compete with, with remediation projects and that sort of stuff. And the, the reality is that these people, people are coming and they have um, these huge expectations, but some of them, like the ones that are bouncing out of remediation, they, they, they're they not used to doing advice in the way that it's evolved over the last year or couple of years. So it's almost yeah. like you're starting again and they might have had experience three or five years ago, but, the, you, you know, is that really relevant? Yeah, they're looking backwards. They're looking backwards at what's happened in the past and they're remediating kind of frameworks from five, four and five years ago. Um, it's, 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 it's not, I don't think it's going to be natural, a natural transition. I think you're right. I think there's going to be a lot of education that needs to take place um, mm. to get there where you want it to be. And that's where I think people, most people will shy away from being advisors on the front foot looking externally as opposed to, you know, kind of being more of a farmer. Yeah, but I think that one of the big things that we've sort of that's clicked for us is that when you do nail it with that associate hire and like, you know, we're looking to bring advisors, we've got associates at the moment, but looking to bring a couple more in. And it's like they're, they're, they're basically doing junior, it's like junior advisor work. Well, they're essentially doing advisor work. It's just that they've got a senior advisor that's standing behind the technical stuff as an extra layer of um, support that it means that it's it's easier for someone that's worked in an associate role three or six months even if they've got the right skill set and you know the attributes to make it happen that it's a much easier transition than for me recruiting senior advisors that might be in advisors for 10 years and then they're sort of again starting from the start when they come into right. the business even if they do have active experience because every advice business is so different with their yeah. process and how they do what they do and all those sorts of things so for me I've realize that it does create a solid growth pathway and while you know we're recruiting for these two senior advisors at the moment would probably be the last time we do that because now we're growing our own um seniors that you just end up with a steady supply which is great for for a growing business but i think it's that um how you plan around it and there's different levels of you know you've got you get your team so you've got lots of advisors and less support staff it's more profitable because you've got more revenue but then everyone's under pressure and then you put more support staff and you got you know the balance changes and then you got more costs and um yeah. challenging to, to balance it around as well so um haven't fully cracked the code yet but uh i think that finding that you know getting clarity on what that looks like and making sure yeah. that it works as you do grow as opposed to like what we've done in the, in the past is more reactive that um yeah, yeah it's it, it, it's something that you need to nail especially given how quickly things can change in the current yeah. environment i think um, the um i think the challenge is i think good practices will need to be more deliberate in planning for the future and depending on what growth trajectory you're on, you'll need to start putting some frameworks and timing around when those hires need to take place because it's taking longer to find that talent. Yeah. Um, it's almost a chicken or the egg style conversation. And, you know, excuse the kind of, you know, his poor kind of analogy, but it's, it's, it's so true that, you know, if, if you really are looking at that growth phase as being, you know, the next five years, and you expect X number of clients to come through and off the back of that, there's X amount of implementation and everything else. The business needs to fatten up around to manage that, but you can't bring someone in ready trained at that point. So the revenue growth between now and that point when you need them needs to almost be sacrificed to get the training in place and to build out the team. Yeah. So you're preempting what's going to happen so you don't implode when all yeah. the new clients are coming on and you're falling over yourself because you haven't you haven't kind of planned adequately. And and that mm -hmm. hire, as you've said, you know, the, the issue is it's just taking far longer to find the talent that you need. But it's going to hit profitability in the short term. And that's why I think businesses will stagnate short term as they're investing in getting that talent. Yeah. But you've got to, given that the amount of inputs there, it's it's more important than ever, I think, that you're focusing on your numbers and making sure yeah. that you're rock solid for so that you can balance that and do it in a way that actually works for your business because yeah. you don't want to be going backwards or, you know, you blow up your war chest and then, um, mm. you know, it, it creates risk in your business as well. Yeah. So yeah. I, mean, I, could, 
I could honestly geek out all day on the um, uh, the HR growth stuff that I was saying to you before that it's been <laughs> the last six months. It's been a massive sort of building that muscle for, for us in the business and it's super, super interesting. And then you've got like even with all of those things and the planning that you put into it, you, there's a human element and everyone's different and different skill sets and approaches that it's um, it's like a weird game of Tetris, but it's an interesting one to try and crack for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, think, I think businesses are being far more deliberate now in that planning process. And I think kind of 10 years ago, you asked to practice, um, you know, what's your profit number? They would have kind of eyes would have rolled and said, oh, look, I make, I pull out X amount and that's that's pretty yeah. cool. How much money do you make? Where are your expenses? You know, where are your pain points in your business? I think the generation that are coming through are far, acute, far more acutely aware of what's actually happening in their practice. Um, mm. They're far more deliberate about where they're spending money and, and they have longer um, uh, well thought out planning processes so they understand and they can start to preempt. Uh, that, that's that's my experience. That's what we're seeing in our community. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be different for different communities depending on the phase that they're sitting in. But I think good practices now need to think as business owners, not as financial advisors working with clients. They're running good practices and they need to be very deliberate around you know, how they're allocating funds and you know, where they're going and, and, and what infrastructure they need on that journey as well. Totally. And it's different skill sets and muscles that you need to build as well. That this is something that our business coach talks a lot about, that it's like the skills that get you to being a great advisor don't necessarily mean you're going to be a great business owner. So you need to work at that and put people around you that can support yeah. that um, as yeah, well. But, uh, but it's an interesting, you know, interesting journey to, to be on for sure. Mate, look, I could honestly talk about this all day, but uh, uh, I, I won't. Uh, I won't break your brain too much with the HR talk, no. Gavin. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, buddy. My last question for you is that if you could go back to uh, little Gav, twenty, you said twenty uh, years ago, you know, yeah. fresh faced and and um, uh, starry eyed, coming into the industry, what would be your 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 one big piece of advice? Oh wow, that's that's a that's a big loaded question. 20 years ago when I started in finance, I, I really didn't know an awful lot. And, and I, I think looking back now, I know I didn't, I, I know I didn't know a lot. And I think, I think probably the education piece for me kind of took a while to kind of continue on. Like I learned a lot on the job, the institutional world, in Royal Sun Alliance, which morphed into Astron, et cetera. I, I think had I done more study earlier, I think I would have kind of broadened my horizons probably a little bit more, a little, a little quicker. I think that would have, that would have kind of been the case. So I think the education piece, doing as much as I could have done earlier, would have definitely helped me and put me in a, in a strong position. That being said, I'm, I'm very happy with how things are going now and the evolution of you know, my career and how things have gone. But um, mm. I think education for me, I think, is is definitely um, definitely the key, I think, of, of, of learning and, and being more aware of what's not just happening in our environment but kind of globally as well. So I think it's a – I think that different kind of – different thinking kind of pays dividends and along that journey you, know, you get to meet a lot of different people and you know i've been very fortunate to have some great mentors and work with some really brilliant minds over the years and you know in that learned so much from them and i think being open at that stage to being a sponge put me in a good position but i think mm. kind of doing more early on would have would have helped me a lot as well love it i think it's um it's all a journey and you know the the formal stuff i think supplements sometimes experiences it is the best teacher um mm. it, you know with different things as well so uh mate thank you again so much really appreciate you sharing your insights yeah no worries. great to be on uh, the xy podcast again cheers Gav. all good mate we'll see you next time great thanks man cheers mate